Well, thank you so much for your kind introduction. I'm very excited to be here. I had never been in Yale before. I knew it was beautiful, but not this beautiful. And you organized this amazing sunny day for me, so I am really happy to be here. Um, this title uh, might be puzzling for somebody, so let's start out with explaining it. Um, it really tries to deal with two issues. One, of course, is related to the term secondary and copies. Well, copies are considered to be a secondary kind of source with respect to the original, which is the primary source on which we rely. Um, and so the issue is whether many copies may, in fact, uh, be a primary source as the original that is lost. The second issue has to do with permanence. Now, thoughts, actions, events cannot be frozen in time. They happen and go. But we can make them permain over time if we embed them in a document. And we can do it because we want to preserve the memory of what happened or what we thought or because we just wish to communicate them, that is to make them cross space, not just time. And when we do that, in fact, we generate something that does continue to be. And sometimes we want it to continue to be. And that's why we have memory institutions to preserve the documentary memory of our time. But sometimes we really don't think about the permanence of what we generate. We just generate it. And then it is there someplace and keeps being there. And nobody's getting rid of it. So this is the involuntary permanence of the many copies that we are generating today. So the, this is what the subject of this lecture today is. Um, if you think uh, that this is an issue of digital times, it is not. Uh, at the time of classic ROM, the records were written on wax, right? And they were taken through underground tunnels from the offices to the tabularium where they had to be put in a, in a very protected place because, of course, everybody could tamper with wax. And then the many scribes would make copies, a multitude of copies. They were passed on for access to people. Among these people, Kikero, who would transcribe them in his writing. So you see, it's a never-ending chain when it starts. And it started then, and it continues now. And we're still finding copies of documents that were supposed to have been destroyed. So as we talk about Rome, Roma law, most concepts that control the way we deal with documents come from Roma law. For example, documents preserve perpetual memory of facts and acts to which they relate. Authentication has to be based on procedure, on how the documents are generated and used. The deposit of a document in a public place guarantees their reliability as a testimony of the actions that the document talks about. Antiquity gives documents the highest authority. Why? Because obviously they were not generated for the uses we make of them today. So you can trust what they say because they were not tailored to say what we want them to say today. Unbroken legitimate custody ensures document authenticity, of course, by inference. This is the Justinian Code. We have built much of it on the Justinian Code. But of course, this is a body of laws, and laws are made to be broken. <laughs> so. The rule of law was circumvented. It is very easy to go against, to use those rules by, for example, bringing a forgery to a public repository and depositing it there. 
and automatically becomes trustworthy. So in the 17th century, a Benedictine, uh, Don Jean Babillon, in France, developed a discipline called diplomatics, which means about records. And it basically demonstrated that you can base the trustworthiness of documents on the analysis of the process of their genesis, on their form, on their structure, and on the way they are transmitted through time and space. So during those times, there were many judicial disputes on the authenticity of documents, which were called bella diplomatica, diplomatic wars. And they were based on diplomatic methods because, and I quote now the Bishop of Venice at the time, Baldassare Bonifacio, who said it is so much better to win by reason than by force. So records, are, documents are so much better than navy yards and weapons. And that's the way in which the law of evidence uh, had origin in the faculties of law in Europe. So by mid 18th century, all the faculties of law taught archival science and diplomatics as forensic disciplines. That is, in order to prove the facts that the documents talked about. So then, if you put together archival concepts and diplomatic concepts, you get this field of study that is called archival diplomatics, which analyzes documents on their own as individual items, that's diplomatics, and in context among all the documents of which, uh, to which they are related, and that's archival science. Okay? Now, we can use this science, archival diplomatics, Come forward, there are lots of seats here. <laughs> we, can, we can use it retrospectively, that is, in order to understand what happened in the past, or to understand and identify the documents of the past, or we can use them prospectively, that is, to design the systems that will generate the records of the future. So once we understand what are the essential elements of the documents on which we can base our assessment of what they are, or whether they're trustworthy, etc., we can embed those elements in the systems that we design for the creation of future documents. So that's the way archival diplomatics is used today. That's why you have the Janus face there, right? The two faces, looking at the past and looking at the future. And there are three specific areas that we deal with in archival diplomatics. You can see on the left, the concept of record. So the analysis of all manifestations of records through time and form and element. In the middle, the process of creation of the documents through time. And on the right, the trustworthiness. Now, we want to focus now on the trustworthiness area for a moment or more. Can I move this? OK. So trustworthiness really consists of three concepts, reliability, accuracy, and authenticity which are quite distinct. So the reliability is the trustworthiness of a document as a statement of fact. That is, as to its content. It means you trust what the document says. How do you assess reliability? Normally, you base it on the competence of the author. For example, if you have a blueprint and the author is an engineer, you tend to trust it more than if the author is the janitor of the building, right? So you see, you is, is again an inference. I trust the author, I trust the document or its content. And the second element is the control on the creation. Not everybody can get into the system. Not everybody can use that letterhead. Not everybody can use that stamp and so on. Accuracy is the correctness and precision of the content. So it's really the data within the content. 
and again is based on the confidence of the other, but in addition is based on control on transmission. Because especially in the digital environment, when you transmit a document from a system to another, you easily get modifications. Authenticity is the thing we want to look at today in particular, is the trustworthiness of a document that is what it says it is, which has been uncorrupted and untampered with. And we base it on two very important factors, on the identity of the document and on its integrity. So, what document though? On which type of document we base it? Well, we know from diplomatics that a document can have different degrees of perfection. And the degree of perfection of a document determines its authority. So if you write a note without signing it, it doesn't have much of an authority. But if you put 20 stamps on it and as many signature and a gold seal, you get the impression that this document is saying something really important, right? So there are three st states of transmission of documents, only three ways that a document can be. It can be a draft, which is a document prepared for purposes of correction. It is meant to be prov provisional. It is meant to be temporary. It does not mean that it is not important. To an historian, a draft may be more important than the actual original document that was generated from it. But it simply means it was not meant to have legal consequences. It was not meant to attest to facts. It was meant in preparation of something else. Okay. Then you have the original. And the original has to have three characteristics. Primitiveness must be the first but it must be the first that is complete, so completeness, and must be able to reach the purposes for which it was generated. So why do I write there in brackets of facts? Well, because what do you do when you have a document that is the first and it is complete, the one that you put in a fax machine, but is unable to reach its purposes other than by the creation of another document on the other side? Right? which is the one that is effective, but is not complete because it doesn't have the original signature and it is not the first. And this is the reason why procedurally we always require that both the sender and the recipient keep their own part because together it is an original. Separated, they don't attest to anything. So, and you know why? Because the received document can prove that was sent by a specific machine at a specific time. It cannot prove who actually put it in the machine, number one, and what was put in the machine. Because I could fold three documents together to compose something and pass it through. And then separate them. So I can always say I never send it. There is no such a document with me. So especially when documents are supposed to reach legal effects, you better <laughs> keep it on both sides. Uh, so the concept of original resists through time. When we think about the digital environment, so many people say, oh, there is no original. Of course there is original, except it lasts for a nanosecond because the original is the document that is first received by the intended recipient. You open it, you look at it, that's your original. Then you save it, by doing that you take it apart and destroy it. And then every time you recall it, you create an, a new one, it's a copy. But the original exists even if for a brief time. Now, through the law, uh, the legal systems in both the civil, system, uh, civil law system and the common law system, the original has always been the best evidence. So what happens when we don't have an original? Okay, we often have lost originals. And copies are not just made for convenience so that they can be accessed by many, but they can be made for legal purposes. So we have different kinds of copies. And what distinguishes them is the authority that they have, but also who generates them. So for example, an authentic copy 
is a copy that is declared to be authentic, that is conformed to the original by an officer who has that responsibility, cannot be you. It has got to be a notary, a lawyer, a professional. It has to be somebody else, a third party, okay? So that's an authentic copy. It doesn't have to be identical, as long as the person who declares it authentic considers it to be essentially the same, okay? Then we have the facsimile. Anybody can do a facsimile. You can make a facsimile for exhibition. What is typical of the facsimile is that the medium on which the document is is identical to the one of the original. It's not just the content. The whole thing is identical. If you were not actually uh, announcing that this was not the original, you could, anybody could think that it is the original. Then there is the copy in the form of the original. The copy in the form of the original is a second original. That is, the same person who has issued the original later on issues it again. So that means that it is not the first. Primitiveness is missing. But the other two qualities are there, which are completeness, because it's absolutely identical to the original, and effectiveness. An imitative copy is a copy that looks like the original, but really it has elements that make you distinguish it from the original, a photocopy. A photocopy is the typical imitative copy. A simple copy is just a transcription. It's when you just sit there and copy a document. An insert is a the, the copy, the transcription of a document within another document. For example, when you forward an email to somebody, what is inside is an insert. So it's a document contained within another document. An inspeximus, instead, has really the same force as the original and substitute the original. What is it? When you have, this is very typical of old times. Uh, traditionally, in, in, all, in all jurisdictions, for certain legal acts, the record is the act. No record, no act. So, a contract of land ownership. You need the record. You lose the record, you don't have the land unless you have a system of registry, but that didn't exist in the past, okay? Or the emperor or the king gives you a benefit, the record is the benefit, that gets in a fire, is gone. Or over time, they just crumble. And as they crumble, the owner would go to a notary, a notary public, or a lawyer, and ask for an inspeximus. So the notary public or lawyer looks at the documents and transcribes it, writing, I have seen Vidimus, or I have inspected Ispeximus, the original document that says so, 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 and so. Transcribes completely, signs it, you can destroy the original. That is the most traditional way through which the titles of old families and cities, etc., have been preserved over time. Then the other thing that you have to look at when you look at copy, in addition to who issues it and how much authority it is, is also the hierarchy of copies. So you can copy from an original, you can copy from a first copy, you can copy from the tenth copy. So the possibility of error keeps growing. So if you have, uh, you know, the monasteries used to copy the text in order to make them go through centuries, because of course paper and parchment and would crumble and the ink would disappear, so that was the purpose. But human error keeps compounding itself over time. So if you have a second copy, it has more authority than if you have the tenth copy of something. So that is also one thing that has to be looked at. Now in the digital environment, let's move away. Those are the concepts that are the foundation of everything. Now we have to confront what we are dealing with. 
We have digitized originals, which as originals were on other media, and we have no problem with them. That corresponds pretty much to an authentic copy. You digitize it and you declare that it is conform to the original. In all the, the uh, aspects that matter, that is everything but the medium, but all the rest is as if it were the original. So there is no problem there. Born digital originals, we already said, exist for a nanosecond. So what are we dealing with? We deal with synchronic copies, that is copies made all at the same time. Uh, for example, when you send a message to 20 people at the same time. We're dealing with diachronic copies, for example, when you save them to an external hard drive or when you make after the time you regularly copy something for redundancy so that you are sure that if something is destroyed you still have an item somewhere. Or for distribution to a variety of repository, the locks system, lots of copies make stuff safe. That's the lock system. One thing we have learned is that all the copies made through redundancy and distribution are never identical to each other. If anything, at least the metadata related to time has changed, okay? Never identical. The other thing we learned is you cannot preserve digital documents. You can only preserve the ability to reproduce them or to recreate them, and we will see the difference later on. However, in order to reproduce or recreate a document, you have to have a document in the first place, right? That is, you need to have fixed form and stable content. What is a document with fixed form in the digital environment? Okay, this is a type, it's a digital entity whose binary content is stored in such a way that what you see on the screen every time you recall it is identical to what you had seen before, okay? That is, the documentary presentation remains constant even if the technological or digital presentation changes. So you can move a, a document from Word to PDF. is a different <coughs> digital format, but what you see on the screen is the same, okay? So that is a document with fixed form, but also, a document has fixed form if the same content can be presented on the screen in several different ways, but in a limited number of possibilities. So the same stored entity can show up in different form. For example, statistical data can be viewed as a pie chart, a bar chart, or a table but it is a limited number and it is always the same possibilities and the same data. Stable content means that the data and the message it conveys are unchanged and unchangeable. So the data cannot be overwritten, altered, deleted, or added to. Or it means that the changes are limited and controlled by fixed rules so that the same query generates the same outcome. And we have different views of different subsets of content. For example, a library catalog, an archival inventory. You never see it all together, right? You do a query and you see the entry that you want. But the same query always will get you the same response, okay? So that is still considered fixed, uh, stable content. Now. When we think about the document in the digital environment in terms of fixity and stability and authenticity, etc., we have to think of three parts, not just one. It's not just this item that you pick up. It's three things that live quite separately from each other. One is the formal elements of the document, which are the traditional ones we see on the face of a document. Uh, the date, the address, the salutation, etc. The other one is the metadata, which are the attributes of the document. Now, the metadata are not an invention of the digital environment, okay? We always said metadata. We didn't call them metadata. 
we call the extrinsic elements of the document. That is, think of some old document folded, right? Like docket style. You fold it and you put it like on the back, on the dorsum. There is an endorsement, right? Which has the date of the document, the name of the addressee, the name of who is keeping the document, the subject of the document. Those are the metadata. On the front of the document, what do we write when we receive it? The date of receipt. What do we write, what do we affix on it? The stamp with the name of the office receiving it. Those are all the metadata. The same metadata are needed and are present in the digital records, except that they're not, they are transparent to the user. You don't see them. On the paper, you do. Digital components. Digital components are those stored entities that are what you actually preserve or conserve in the digital world. You don't see them, so, and they do not correspond to the part of the document. So for example, if you have 10 memos that are all in the same format and they're all textual, they can all be in one component, one digital component. But if you have an email with attachments and the digital signature, you have the header, the message, the attachment, and the digital signature. There are five components. They go in five different parts of the system and need a different preservation measure. So you understand that here you're dealing at a completely different level with different parts that eventually to reproduce the document so that you see on the screen have to get all together. Because what we never had before is the difference between a stored document and a manifested document. So in fact, with a digital entity, we have at least two documents every single time. The stored document is made up of the components used in reproducing the document, that is, in producing it again when you recall it. And they are the data to be processed in order to show the document, which are content data and form data. The rules for processing them, which are the composition data. That's all the stored document. The manifested document is the visualization in a form that is suitable for reading to a person or to a system. Now, sometimes you don't have this manifestation. For example, you go to the ATM to get money, right? You put your card in there and something happens within the system. That is, the system is checking whether you've got the money and then decides to give you some, and then makes all the calculations, subtracts your money from what you had. Every single action generates stored records. That is content data, form data, and composition data that the system sees, but you will never see. What you get is the receipt at the end, okay? So, um, the, you can, in other cases, you do not have a stored manifested document, okay? But you can recreate it, like in a relational database. So when you have a relational database and you ask a query, a document shows up. You can decide to save it as such, as what you actually see, in which case you have a manifested document, you have a stored document. Or you don't save it because you know that every time you want to see it, you just go through the same query. So in that case, you recreate the document every time. You see, you're not reproducing. You're recreating it. Types of digital documents, two types. Static, the ones that only allow you to open, <coughs> close, and navigate, and nothing else. And interactive, they have variable content, form, etc. But the rules are fixed. That is, whatever you do, always you get the same output. Okay, so in light of all the above, when we talk about digital copies, what you need to do 
is to identify the authoritative copy, because we have millions of that. And the best way of identifying them, there are other ways that I will mention, but the best way is to look at the metadata, which are the primary means of provide authority to a copy or to identify the authority of a copy. Okay, identity metadata, definition. Identity metadata are all the attributes of a document that characterize it as unique altogether. They make it unique. It's like, you know, your identity card. It says where you're born, when you were born, you know, uh, and, and all the, where you live, etc. So all those elements, they make up that your card. This is the same thing. Identity metadata are unique together for each document. And these are the ones that we call identity metadata, the names of the person that concur to the creation of that document, the dates, times of genesis, issuing, and transmission, matter or subject, relationships, form name, format presentation, attachments, and if applicable, a digital signature. You actually don't need anything more. In fact, we were saying today at lunch that really all you need is the expression of the relationship to other documents. Because once you identify that, then you can go to all the rest. You can access everything else. You have a classification code, like a person has an ID, that's it, that's the person. From there I can go anywhere. So this idea of having as metadata for 125 attributes, it's really not only not realistic, but not needed. Integrity, a document has integrity if the message it is meant to communicate uh, to achieve its purpose has not changed. You see, the message needed to communicate has not changed. What are there? Well, okay, so we have traditionally said we uh, infer integrity from the fact that we trust whoever is keeping the record. So you go, you, you deduce integrity from responsibility. And you say, if I know the names of the persons that handle the document over time, if I know who is responsible for keeping the record, if there are annotations related to changes, both technical changes and any other kind, uh, if there is a digital signature, etc. if I have these elements, then I can say, I can infer integrity which is the quality of being complete and unaltered in all essential respects. And we have never been fussy about it, right? So if you had a document with a hole in the middle, or yellowish, or with a ink fading away, or with the corners burned, you wouldn't say, oh, it has lost integrity, so we don't want it. It's no longer authentic. You would say it's good enough, right? As long as I, I know what it is. Well, is that different in the digital environment? Let's see. Loss of integrity of an analog document. You still read it, still manage, still okay. You still have the same document, don't you? Now, digital document. If the original bits are 101, it is a five. If it is 110, it is a six. If it is 011, it is a three. Same bits, different value. Why? Because the order counts, not just the, the number. So you can see that we're not talking about fading away. We're talking about losing bits, we lose the record. Because we're talking about data integrity based on bitwise integrity. The fact that the data are not modified intentionally or accidentally. The bits are in a complete and unaltered state. So a small change in the bits means a different value on the screen and a different action. How do we protect them? Well, intentional alteration is preventable through permission and access control, access privileges, or through checksum and ASH algorithm. Accidental alteration is preventable through special hardware and software. But the problem is that we have to be able to determine that alteration has happened. Most of the times, we don't really know. 
And so what do we do? Do we go and check the logs? Yes, on a regular way we could. But in fact, we have to infer integrity till such time when it is questioned. And then you have the logs to control it. Otherwise, there is no other way. And as regards copies, because we live in a copy world, in a world of copies, duplication integrity is important. It's the process. So given a document, a digital document, you must be sure that the process of copying it doesn't change it. And often, this change is linked to time. The idea is today wouldn't, but tomorrow it would, the process that you carry out, because it depends on what else is in the system. So, and of course, we do duplication all the time, but not necessarily the output is the same. When we talk about a copy, we talk about a selective duplicate. A selective duplicate is never the same as the original because you can only copy what you can see, and on paper it was very easy because you could see the metadata. You can see the metadata in, in the digital environment or other things like the dot metadata. There is rarely confirmation of completeness and there is an incomplete picture of the environment. The image is a forensic duplication, is a bit by bit reproduction of everything uh, but you may not want to have that sort of duplication to deal with because then you would have to maintain it, all those parts like swap space, lag space, ambient data, etc., that are useless. You don't want to. So how do you have an authentic duplication? Well, you have an authentic duplication when in some way you can maintain a native format. Now, uh, over time, we have been used to PDF, right, for delivering page-based documents. Uh, we use for preservation PDF-A uh, because it allows to maintain all the fonts. PDF-A2 increases accessibility, but PDF-A3 is where we're heading now because what it does is to provide you the service of PDF A1, that is, you see uh, the, the document as, as it shows permanently on the screen, but it can embed all the previous formats. So it is what is used now to address the issues of obsolescence and of readability and usability and it gives you the main display document uh, in a stable and fixed way, and the metadata set can be stored in the dumb data sections to ensure authenticity. So any concern about best evidence and data integrity can be addressed in embedding the bit stream of the source within this document. So this is what now is considered to be the copy that is appropriate mostly against obsolescence and for the purposes of best evidence in a court of law. And the process through which we do it must follow the principle of non-interference, uh, which means that the method you use is not changing anything, or the principle of identifiable interference. If it is changing anything, you say what it is. You can identify it. Um, I don't think we have the time to talk about digital signature. I have five minutes, so I have the time. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so there is a difference between authenticity and authentication that is key. Because authenticity is a quality of the document. Either it's authentic or it isn't. Okay? Authentication is a declaration that the document is authentic in that specific moment, but not necessarily the next day. Okay. So today we use digital signature for authentication, and digital signature is not a signature. It is a seal, because it is an attachment to a complete document. 
that already has its own signature or whatever needs to have, is complete as is. It verifies the origin of the document, certifies the, the intactness of the document, and makes authorship and ownership indisputable. That is no repudiation, okay? So, the digital signature, talking about copies, is said to provide incontrovertible mechanism for verifying authenticity of digital object. Right, except what it is that it verifies, that the person who claims to have sent the document is in fact the person who claims, who is, right? And it verifies that the document that was put into the system and sent has not been altered. It does not verify that the copy is actually a copy of the document that it claims to be. <laughs> So we are back to the same thing. All this mechanical system, they just prove you that what you receive is what was sent by that person. But that person is sending you the copy of a document that she or he is claiming to be something that you can't <coughs> prove, certainly not with the digital signature. Besides, digital signatures are good for ensuring authenticity of documents as they move across space from a system to another, not across time, because it becomes obsolete before the documents to which it is attached and cannot really be preserved. And memory institutions are not maintaining them. So what's better to use? While well, a chain of legitimate custody is ground for inferring authenticity, <coughs> the digital chain of custody is the list of all that has been done to the record for the document from beginning to end and the declaration on the trustworthiness of the system within which the document exists. So especially the courts now saying, well, if I can trust that nobody has interfered with the system, so I will believe that the document in the system are okay. It's an inference again. So we get to the main slide here, involuntary secondary permanence, where? So now, by now you know, we have already lost track of everything. The copies are uncontrollable. They are everywhere. They're distributed, they're redundant. They, there are lots of authenticated copies for preservation, etc. And we don't really want to keep them, but we don't know where to find them in order to destroy them, so we give up. That's the situation. Except it's not much of a problem. If we have an in-house system, if everything is inside our building and our servers, well, it clogs the system, but really, it's not such a problem. But what if the documents are not with us? What if the documents are in the custody of some cloud provider, of some other third party? How do we prove the trustworthiness of the copies that they have and they control? That's why we created the fourth phase of Interpares, Interpares Trust, or I trust. So this is the fourth phase of the research project. Its goal is to generate theoretical and methodological frameworks to support the development of networks of policies, procedures, regulations, standards, and legislation concerning digital documents and trust to the internet. It is funded for five years. Um, it includes about 300 partners from six continents and 35 countries, and this is in order to ensure that whatever we generate is consistent across. And the reason is that the documentary memory of the world is increasingly in the cloud because archives and libraries have to acquire material that already exists in the cloud. And they have to provide ac access from everywhere to anybody. Uh, the systems that are required by ISO are not affordable. The knowledge required to deal with this material is not affordable. Uh, many believe that protection equals preservation, which is not true, but under this illusion, this is what they do, but mostly we are confronted with a generational change where the younger people post-1981 they integrate public and private, they co-author things, there is crowdsourcing, there is co-owning, sharing, 
working from home, bringing your own device to work, uh, and the material is on a variety of clouds. Convergence of media, if I tell you that I will meet you at five o'clock, I send you a Google map, right? I don't give you an address. Um, cost and connectivity, liquid communication, an enormous amount of ephemeral material generated. What is its characteristics? They can be viewed differently based on choice of browser, application, user preferences, so it is impossible to say which one is the authoritative version. Unless you have the authoritative version in your in-house system. Metadata may be constructed by anybody to manipulate the behavior of the system, not just to describe it. If the goal is communication, you have a specific way of having the document to self-destruct. But if you don't do that, nobody's going to destroy them. When Google promised to eliminate with the international court, right, you know, the, the verdict to eliminate all the documents related to a specific situation, it cut the links. It didn't eliminate the documents. The documents are there. So if you use a different search, rather than the name of the person, you search copyright in a specific kind of articles, you find all the articles again. So everything is there. It will never go away. <laughs> so never put up there anything you don't want to be used against your grandchildren in the next 100 years. So if the goal is memory, now people create their own digital archives out of you know, documents taken from everywhere. So the primary challenges very quickly are the reuse, the creation of derivative works, the sharing, movement of material from one circle of people to another, constantly innumerable copies. Uh, employees collectively create bodies of interlinked material, Government of Canada, Wikipedia, 150 department, 250,000 employees create documents together. Uh, and so nobody knows to which agency each document belongs and when has been completed or generated. Location independence. So the jurisdiction of the entity responsible for preservation is different from the jurisdiction of the entity responsible for storage. And so involuntary permanence is rising to a whole other level. You know what the cloud is, so we don't need to say. The issues obviously are transparency, ownership, authorship, creatorship, retention and disposition, loss of context, trustworthiness, jurisdiction, and ethics. So traditionally, we deal with this with policy, training, model agreements, but that's not enough. We need much more because many or any copy can only replace an original by having the authority and the effectiveness of an original. And we don't know that any of this does. So stay tuned. Thank you.